At what age do you think an individual becomes responsible for their own actions? At what age are they legally liable for their crimes? Common knowledge claims 18, but what about those individuals under that age? What about the serial murders under 12? The child killers at the tender age of 7? Who's liable for their actions? Welcome friends to Forgotten Mysteries, where we unearth truths often lost within the annals of time. If you're new here do subscribe, check out our other mysteries, and a grand welcome to our returning viewers. Today we take a gander at the peculiar cases of three individuals who have been involved in high-profile criminal cases, primarily centered around the US. So, grab your favorite beverage, and let's take a look at another forgotten mystery. We begin with Scott Hain. Scott Hain was a death row inmate in Ohio who was convicted of murder in a high-profile case. Scott Hain was involved in a brutal murder that occurred in 2000 when he was just 16 years old. On the 27th of April Hain, along with his accomplice, Jerry Ferguson, broke into the home of Michael Lefkowitz, a wealthy businessman, in Alliance, Ohio. During the robbery, Hain and Ferguson killed Lefkowitz, stabbing him multiple times. They stole money, firearms, and other items from the house. After the murder took place, law enforcement authorities launched an investigation into the crime. Detectives and forensic experts work to gather evidence, analyze the crime scene, and identify potential suspects. During the investigation, tips from the public played a significant role in helping the authorities identify Hain and Ferguson as potential suspects. It's unclear what specific information led to their identification, as the details may not be widely available. Following the murder, Hain and Ferguson were apprehended by law enforcement. They were charged with aggravated murder, aggravated burglary, and aggravated robbery. Hain admitted his involvement in the crime but claimed that Ferguson was the primary perpetrator. Hain and Ferguson were tried together. The prosecution argued that both individuals were equally responsible for the murder, while Hain's defense focused on minimizing his level of participation and blaming Ferguson for the fatal stabbing. In November 2001, a jury found both Hain and Ferguson guilty of aggravated murder, aggravated burglary, and aggravated robbery. The jury recommended the death penalty for Hain, while Ferguson received a life sentence without parole. Hain's case faced numerous appeals and legal challenges, particularly surrounding his status as a juvenile offender. Advocates and legal teams argued that executing a person who committed a crime as a minor was unconstitutional and went against evolving standards of decency. In 2005, the Ohio Supreme Court overturned Haynes' death sentence, citing constitutional concerns under the Ohio Constitution. As a result, Haynes' sentence was commuted to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. A few key factors that led to the change in sentencing are as follows. Scott being a juvenile offender, at the time of the crime, Scott Hain was only 16 years old, making him a juvenile offender. The U.S. Supreme Court has issued several rulings that restricted the use of the death penalty for juvenile offenders, citing the immaturity and diminished culpability associated with youth. Constitutional concerns, the Ohio Supreme Court, in considering Hain's case, analyzed the state's constitution and its application to juvenile offenders. They concluded that imposing the death penalty on individuals who were under the age of 18 at the time of the offense violated the Ohio Constitution's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. And finally, the evolving standards of decency. The court took into account evolving societal norms and a growing national consensus against executing juvenile offenders. They recognized a shift in public opinion and legal standards that favored a more lenient approach when dealing with minors convicted of serious crimes. As a result of the Ohio Supreme Court's ruling, Scott Haynes' death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. This decision reflected a recognition of the unique considerations surrounding juvenile offenders and the constitutional protections afforded to them. Another such individual is Napoleon Beasley. Napoleon Beasley was also a death row inmate in Texas. In 1994, at the age of 17, Beasley and two accomplices carjacked John Luttig, a federal judge and his family. Beasley shot and killed Luttig in front of his home. 
Beasley was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death. Napoleon Beasley was born on September 4, 1980, in Grapeland, Texas. He grew up in a middle-class African-American family and was raised primarily in the town of Tyler, Texas. Beasley attended John Tyler High School, where he was involved in extracurricular activities and was described as a promising student-athlete. Napoleon Beasley was involved in a carjacking that escalated into a tragic and fatal incident. Here are the details of the crime. On April 19, 1994, when Beasley was 17 years old, he, along with two accomplices, Cedric Coleman and Donald Coleman, targeted John Luttig, a federal judge, and his family in Tyler, Texas. The incident took place as the Luttig family returned home from a church service. The three perpetrators confronted the Luttig family in their driveway, aiming to steal their car. However, the situation quickly turned violent. In the course of the carjacking, Beasley, armed with a firearm, shot and killed Judge Luttig. John Luttig, a respected federal judge, suffered fatal gunshot wounds in front of his home. The violent act shocked the community and resulted in a widespread investigation to identify and apprehend the individuals responsible. Following the carjacking and murder, Beasley and his accomplices fled the scene. However, their escape was short-lived as law enforcement authorities swiftly apprehended them. Beasley was subsequently charged with capital murder for his direct involvement in the crime. The prosecution argued that his actions demonstrated premeditation, as he intentionally shot and killed Judge Luttig during the carjacking. The trial of Napoleon Beasley took place in Smith County, Texas, where the crime occurred. The trial began in February 1995 and lasted for several weeks, culminating in the jury's verdict and sentencing. Beasley was charged with capital murder for his role in the carjacking and fatal shooting of Judge John Luttig. Capital murder is a serious offense that carries the potential for the death penalty in Texas. Beasley was represented by a defense team consisting of experienced criminal defense attorneys. They were responsible for presenting his case, challenging the prosecution's evidence, and advocating for a favorable outcome. The prosecution aimed to prove Beasley's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They presented evidence, including witness testimonies, forensic analysis, and the circumstances surrounding the crime, to establish that Beasley actively participated in the carjacking and directly caused the death of Judge Luttig. The defense team focused on mitigating factors and presenting arguments to potentially lessen Beasley's culpability and argue against the imposition of the death penalty. They likely emphasized Beasley's young age at the time of the crime, his background, and any other factors that could humanize him in the eyes of the jury. After deliberation, the jury found Napoleon Beasley guilty of capital murder. During the penalty phase, the jury determined that the death penalty should be imposed based on the aggravating factors presented by the prosecution. Following the trial, Beasley's legal team pursued a series of appeals, challenging the constitutionality of his death sentence, and raising various legal arguments. However, these appeals were ultimately unsuccessful, and his sentence was upheld. Napoleon Beasley waited until 6 o'clock on May 28, 2002, in a windowless cell inside the death house of the Walls Unit in Huntsville. He had said goodbye to his family and friends days earlier, so that he could remain calm during his final hours. He seemed to be in a tranquil state, yet his right foot kept twitching. He wouldn't appear scared until he was bound to the gurney. A group of protesters was gathered by the police barricades in the light rain, some of whom were waving homemade banners with smudged writing. Gloria Ruback, a graying woman, was screaming into a microphone, the state of Texas will murder in 30 minutes. The murder was planned. Poison is the weapon of choice. And every single one of you yahoos with your cowboy hats, she said, glancing at a row of uniformed soldiers, some of whom tensed at her stare. Two dozen foldable chairs had been set up for reporters behind the barricades under a tree, giving the impression that a news conference was being held by the Chamber of Commerce, or even a poorly attended school board meeting. While mundane preparations were being made outdoors, Napoleon refused to eat his final dinner inside. The podium's audio equipment was checked by a prison officer. And finally, the moment had come. 
With a final tearful look at his family and friends, Napoleon was administered the medicine. And within five minutes, Napoleon was with us no more. Solemnly we have T.J. Lane. T.J. Lane, also known as Thomas Michael, T.J. Lane III, was a convicted killer involved in a high-profile school shooting incident in the United States. Here is some background information on T.J. Lane. T.J. Lane was born on September 19, 1994, in Cleveland, Ohio. To parents Thomas Lane Jr. and Sarah Nolan. He had two siblings, a brother named Adam Nolan and a sister named Sadie Lane. He grew up in a troubled environment, with reports of a difficult childhood marked by family issues and behavioral problems. Lane attended Lakeside High School in Ashtabula, Ohio. On February 27, 2012, when Lane was 17 years old, he carried out a shooting at Chardon High School in Chardon, Ohio. Armed with a 22 caliber pistol, Lane entered the school's cafeteria and targeted a group of students. He fired multiple shots, resulting in the death of three students and the injury of three others. Following Lane's arrest and conviction, there were reports of strained relationships between Lane and his family members. It is suggested that his family experienced significant emotional distress and struggled to reconcile with the events and consequences of the shooting. After the shooting, T.J. Lane fled the school but was apprehended a short distance away. He was subsequently arrested and charged with multiple counts of aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder, and felonious assault. During the trial in 2013, Lane pleaded not guilty because of insanity, but his defense was ultimately unsuccessful. The prosecution argued that the shooting was premeditated and that Lane targeted specific individuals. Lane was found guilty on all charges. Lane's defense team pursued an insanity defense strategy, arguing that he was mentally ill at the time of the shooting, and should be found not guilty because of insanity. They presented evidence of Lane's troubled background and alleged mental health issues. Before the trial, Lane underwent evaluations to determine his mental competency to stand trial. The evaluations aimed to assess his understanding of the charges against him and his ability to assist in his own defense. Based on the results, Lane was deemed competent to stand trial. Initially, Lane had entered a guilty plea to charges of aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder, and felonious assault. However, a month after pleading guilty, he withdrew his plea, leading to a trial by jury. During the trial, witnesses, including students who were present during the shooting, testified about the events that transpired. Evidence, such as the firearm used in the shooting and surveillance footage, was presented to establish Lane's guilt. In March 2013, the jury found T.J. Lane guilty on all charges, including three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of attempted aggravated murder, and one count of felonious assault. The aggravated murder charges carried a potential sentence of life imprisonment without parole. In a separate sentencing hearing following the guilty verdict, Lane was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. The judge emphasized the severity of the crimes committed and the impact on the victims' families. Following his conviction and sentencing, T.J. Lane pursued an appeal of his convictions, challenging various aspects of the trial, including the admission of certain evidence and his competency to stand trial. Throughout the proceedings, Lane displayed a disturbing demeanor, wearing a t-shirt with the word, killer written on it and making obscene gestures. Having entered a guilty plea on the anniversary of the February 27, 2012, attack at Chardon High School, Lane faced the consequences of his actions. As family members of the victims took the stand to address the court, Lane responded with a smirk on his face. The mother of one victim, Daniel Palmiter, expressed her feelings of contempt, referring to Lane as a vile coward and a pathetic excuse for a human being. She wished him a slow and painful death, highlighting the emotional toll the crimes have had on her family, including nightmares and physical sickness. As soon as T.J. Lane walked in, he was executing his plan, taking off his button-down shirt to reveal this, 
a white t-shirt with the word killer scribbled on it, showing it off with a smug smile on his face. He wore one like it the day of the shootings. Parents of the victims Life called Lane a same. monster, a pathetic that. excuse for a human being, and wished him a slow, torturous death. I hate you for the pain you have caused, Nick. You chased him down the hall and fired the last bullet that paralyzed him. Why? Why did you do it? Why? Throughout their statements, Lane just smiled. Then at one point even raised his middle finger to victims' families. And his statement to the court? Just too vulgar to say. The first punishment considered for Lane was capital punishment. However, in the state of Ohio, it is deemed as a form of cruel and unusual punishment, thus he was exempted. And the final remedy for his dire action still remains as life imprisonment, without the possibility of parole. As we conclude our chilling journey into the minds of history's most notorious individuals, we bid farewell to the enigmatic world of forgotten mysteries. We hope that you found our exploration into the lives of Scott Hain, Napoleon Beasley, and T.J. Lane both intriguing and thought-provoking. Remember, the secrets we unearthed and the stories we delved into are not for the faint of heart. But it is through confronting the darkness that we can better understand the complexities of human nature. We invite you to continue subscribing to our channel, Forgotten Mysteries, where we delve into the shadows of history, unmasking enigmatic tales that time has forgotten. From unsolved crimes to twisted psychologies, our journey together will unveil the hidden truths, and shed light on the most perplexing enigmas. Don't forget to click the bell icon to receive notifications for our bone-chilling content, ensuring that you never miss a haunting tale from the annals of crime. We also encourage you to share your thoughts and suggestions for future topics or cases in the comments below. Your input is invaluable as we continue this dark expedition. Thank you for joining us on this captivating expedition. Together, let us ensure that the truth is never truly forgotten. Subscribe to Forgotten Mysteries, where the shadows of history come alive.